I am a computer systems engineer, uh, currently working here in Data Science Dojo as an associate data engineer. Uh, nowadays, I mostly focus on the Azure cloud services, and uh, there are some projects here and there as well, so mostly on the application development frameworks too. So uh, let's get started. So what we have in the agenda today, understanding Azure virtual machines, exploring the Azure marketplace, some other terminologies as well, some important terminologies that we must keep in mind when we uh, study infrastructure as a service, especially and then some one-click deployments, and then we will be going through the marketplace and doing some hands-on exercise. Before I go on to explain about Azure Virtual Machine, I would actually ask that how many of you are aware of Virtual Machine itself, like uh, Virtual Machines through VirtualBox or VMware, you can use Virtual Machines through that as well, or maybe some other cloud platform. So any one of you has used virtual machines in any way. VMware is a pretty good tool. So uh, Michael, a follow-up question. Have you ever faced issues like of lagging, your computer starts to get lag and hanging up, things like that using VMware? Has it ever happened to you? Because uh, in my case, it used to happen initially because uh, the, ma the major reason is, so yeah, it happened. So. Uh, the major reason is that when you're using VMware, you create tons of virtual machines, you want to create tunnels, you want to do testing of your software and all of that. And that virtual machine that you create takes resources, compute resources, storage resources of your own PC, of your own computer, right? The good thing with Azure virtual machines or the other GCP machines or the Amazon machines, the good thing is that they are not taking anything from your own computer, right? They have their own servers. Microsoft have their own data centers. They have their own servers, own storage, own power supply, and they are powering this virtual machine for us on their portal. What we have to do is just, we have to go onto the portal, create a virtual machine, and we have a ready-made computer for us. That is the beauty of the virtual machines that we have on cloud. Good thing is that, you do not need to pay up front. I mean, if you buy a computer, uh, you obviously have to pay some amount, right? But with virtual machines, Azure virtual machines especially, you do not need to pay any upfront amount. Rather, you just have to pay as you go. So for example, I, I go and create a virtual machine right now, and I just have to use it for like today. So at 6 p.m., I stop it. The only amount that I'm charged is only for that particular duration that I use the VM. Apart from that, I'm not charged anything. So how cool is that, right? Here you, you can see a word scalable computing resource, right? So scalable means that on demand, you can increase the capacity and memory of your virtual machine as well. Now, for example, I have a computer, I have a 16 GB of memory, right? If I have to increase it, I have to go to the market, buy RAM, do all of that, right? With Azure Virtual Machine, if you think that you have some software in it and that is lagging or uh, it, it is a bit buggy, so what you can do is you can go onto the portal in the virtual machine configuration and just increase the memory. That's it. You are scaling it as per your needs. So that that how much flexibility Azure is providing to its users using virtual machines. And as I said, that you do not need to buy anything or else. The other thing, the, the other special feature I would say uh, provided by Azure are the spot instances. So this thing wasn't there initially. This was later introduced and it is a pretty good thing. Many people are not aware. Whenever somebody wants to use a virtual machine, they just go and create a virtual machine and they start to work on it. And what they want to do mostly, they just want to test something and they create the whole virtual machine. That is a bad approach. The good thing is that Azure provides spot instances. Spot instances allow you to use the unused extra capacity that Azure has for, uh, for the users. So you only use spot instances when you have to test something for a shorter period of time, or you want to run some jobs, workloads as a one-time thing, you use the spot instances and they charge very less as compared to the normal virtual machines. So if you want to do some short thing, you just want to test anything, you just want to do, uh, for example, you want to deploy an app, 
on Docker and you want to use a virtual machine, go with this part instance. You do not need to create the whole virtual machine that will obviously cost more than the spot instance. So I thought to add this because it is not usually talked about much, but obviously there is a trade-off for it. Microsoft is not giving you a low cost just for anything. The thing is that because it's an extra space that Azure has, so in case in the Azure data centers, they are feeling that the availability for virtual machines is getting lesser and lesser because of large number of users. So they will take away that spot instance from you. They will send a notification, of course, but then they will take away. So anything that you will have and in that at the time, it will be removed from you. That's why you only have to use it for a shorter period of time. And that will save cost, obviously. The next thing, Azure provides two stores to download applications marketplace and app source so just like just like how you have iphone iphone ha apple has its own app store android has a play store azure has marketplace and app source now there is a difference between both of them so let's see in marketplace you can find applications services and you can also manage those applications in your own infrastructure in your own customizability with your own flexibility. You can do that with the services you find in Azure Marketplace. On the Azure App Source, you also find uh, softwares and services, but they are mostly dedicated softwares targeting specific industries. So uh, for example, you, for example, Power BI, Microsoft Power BI and its plugins or Microsoft 365 tools, you will find them in Azure App Source because they are ready-made tools you just have to install it on your computer. In Marketplace, you find things that you can customize on your own and more at the basic level. Like some things, a ready-made product, and then a product which is just at the starting, just at the base. That Those services you found in the Azure Marketplace. And that's why it is mostly used by developers or the open source guys, they use Marketplace a lot. And there you can find platform as a service, SaaS, IS uh, services, and different models of paying as well. So pay as you go means that whatever you use, you only pay for that. BYOL, bring your own license, means that they will provide you the software, but you have to bring your own license with it. You have to buy your own license and attach that inside the application. App source mainly focuses on the SaaS applications, like I said, dedicated tools, which are targeted towards specific industries, and they are just the ready-made tools, completely packaged. A bit more on these terminologies. So this pyramid here, as you, you can see that the arrow as we go down, we get more control over the infrastructure. So with infrastructure as a service, we get most of the, we get access to most, even the smallest technical things, you can access it and you can customize it as your own. While with the SaaS applications, they are fully managed by the software companies. So for example, Office 365, do you know the code of Office 365? No, I don't think so. Do you have the code for Zoom? No. The Even if, if you find some code on GitHub, mostly you won't even have access to it. They are maintained by their own developers or their own servers. Everything is managed by Zoom, um, the, the Zoom company, right? On the other hand, there is platform as a service. These are services that allow you to manage your applications in it. For example, AWS, Elastic Beanstalk, Azure App Service, Google App Engine. So for example, if I create an Azure App Service, I have the option to deploy my code, be it a uh, mean stack or modern stack, full stack applications. I can deploy them on Azure App Service. So I do not know that what's the backend code or how the Azure App Service is being maintained. I do not know that, but I'm just getting a pavement through which how I can deploy my code on the App Service. And by the way, App Service enables you to host your websites. So if you created, a, if you have a front end and a back end, you can deploy your code on the app service and then you can have a website running. So that is platform. So it provides you a platform, platform as a service. The last infrastructure as a service, 
These include the computing resources such as virtual machines, which we are going to follow now, uh, storage, storage accounts, networking, subnets, and all, all of these things at the basic level that come under the infrastructure as a service. And the examples are the Azure Cloud, uh, AWS, GCP, all of these uh, are included in the infrastructure as a service. And before we go on to the Azure Marketplace, actually, I want to tell something about the one-click deployments. So this is uh, this has been in the market for some time long, and the, the the good thing is that you do not need to configure things with one one-click deployments. You just see an image, and, and by image I see a software image, a code image, and you install it, deploy it on your own virtual machine or on your own computer. That's it. You do not need to configure the servers manually. You do not need to set up the dependencies, nothing, none, none of that. You just click on the button and you get the software that is available on your own virtual machine. So uh, how about we go to the marketplace now and see some interesting tools. So on the portal, so this is how the Azure portal looks like. So if uh, actually, if you guys uh, have Azure portal, then you can also tag along if you want, that would be good. So portal.azure.com, this is how Azure portal looks like. And there are different services you can see here, marketplace, app registrations. In app registrations, you can register your applications, web applications that you have you can register them here for sign-in, sign-up purposes. Uh, Active directories are used to maintain, Active directories are used to maintain like the user profiles and everything. And then uh, subscription, a subscription provides uh, an account to you so that you can create different resources. So if you do not have a subscription, you cannot create anything on Azure. So you need to have a subscription first. And by the way, uh, if you can create a free account in Azure as well. They provide around, I think, 200 free credits. Uh, you have to enter like your credit card information, something like that initially, but they do not charge and they give you 200 credits as well free, for free. So you can toy around the portal, install services, whatever you want. So about marketplace, it's possible that if you open your portal, you might not see this here. Uh, this usually shows the recent of what you have visited. So you can always search here, marketplace. And this is the app store, the marketplace, uh, the app store of Azure. So uh, here you can see all these different services, different softwares. So there is Neo4j that is being recommended to me. Enterprise, and this is the uh, this is the name of the tool, and this is the name of the company that is in the muted text. So this is an Azure application, okay? And we can see that they are saying that the price varies. So it is an enterprise edition. So it will be for different companies on how they want to use it. Then we have. Ubuntu here, 20.04, this is an OS, and they are providing it on a virtual, on a virtual machine. So, and, 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 and you can see that how much they're charging. They're charging $0.01 per hour. That is provided by NT. So this is the name of the company. Now we know that Ubuntu is officially from Canonical, right? Yeah, here it is from Canonical. It is not the, uh, the, uh, and Tegrel are not the official vendors for Ubuntu, but Ubuntu is an open source. So different companies and marketplace can package different open source tools by their names and they can provide that. Obviously they have to give a credit for that, but it is allowed to do so. And many companies not only do that, but they also provide some extra things as well. So that there is, for example, there are two companies which are providing the same software then who will the user download or install on its virtual machine? So uh, that, that's where the uh, the demand comes in. How much you are providing in a single, if you're just installing an operating system, then uh, I don't think that you will, uh, you will succeed in the long run. You need to have some extra thing over the others as well. On the right, we have this WordPress on app service. 
So you can see that the type here is Azure service. So Azure service here means that it will create an app service, a website actually, I think, and on it, the WordPress will already be installed. So you do not need to set up WordPress by yourself. It will already be set up there. And you see by whom it is provided, it is provided by Microsoft. Similarly, there are other tools as well. And on the left, you can see the categories as well. What category you want to explore. So in compute, we will find things like virtual machines and operating systems, Ubuntu server, and yeah, all of that we will find here. Then let's explore, okay, AI and machine learning. Azure board, this is provided by Microsoft. And uh, with the services provided by Microsoft, they are uh, com uh, they are compatible nicely on your portal. They are fast as well. So that is another good thing. TensorFlow optimized TensorFlow by NVIDIA. So that is pretty nice. Azure machine learning is a service. Uh, this is often used. We have some other webinars for this as well. And so th there is this one tool called Metabase that's been in the market for around, I think since 2014. And it was a pretty good tool. So let's install that. So, okay, so you see Metabase is, uh, it is an open source tool and it is provided by so many companies, right? Niles Partners is providing Metabase as well. Uh, they are also providing it on Debian and then Metabase here as well. And, and you can see, the prices for, for all of them, right? So we are working with virtual machines and let's see for the free ones. So, okay, so DSD has this as well. So, and it is free. So let's let's go ahead with this one. So what, what's this tool about? Metabase is an open source business intelligence framework that provides a web interface, okay. It allows you to import data from diverse databases and then analyze and visualize it. Okay, so I see it is more of a business intelligence tool, I think. And the concept is based on questions, which are queries. Okay, a different concept, but you, does it use SQL as well? It provides an easy to use notebook through which users can gather raw data, join tables, summarize. Okay, without any need for SQL coding. So. Now we can grasp that it is a pretty good tool if you uh, do not know about SQL scripting or uh, if you haven't worked with SQL coding at all, then you can use this tool pretty. So let's see, okay. So they have specified who benefits from this offer. Research students, data analysts, engineers, okay. What is included? A rich web interface, query builder, okay. And then some other features as well. They have also provided that what kind of databases they support. So that's nice as well. And some technical specifications too. And they have, they've provided how to access it as, as well. So when you install it, you can go onto your IP and then you add the port 3000 in it and you'll be able to access Metabase. And there are some media tutorials here as well. So let's just click on create here. So they so they they are providing the image of Metabase on a virtual machine. So automatically we are redirected to the create a virtual machine page. Here I first need to select my subscription. So you need to have some subscription. I will use this one and let's create a new resource group. So if you don't know what is a resource group, a resource group is a logical collection of different resources. A resource can be any VM, it can be an app service, it can be a, a SQL database, it can be a storage account. Any service that you create is like, in other words, it's also called as a resource and you have to group them all together in a container that is called resource group. The good approach of uh, naming your resource group is you write RG and then you add hyphen resource group and then you name whatever you want to name. So let's see, I name it webinar. Okay, so it already exists. So let me name it this way. 
in the name of the virtual machine. So I am install, I'm trying to deploy MetaBase. So let me name it MetaBase VM. The region that depends on from, from, from what region you belong to. So I'm going to select ECS2 here. Availability options, we're going to leave them as it is. Now this is, this is, you can see the image. So this image is coming from the MetaBase image that is packaged by uh, DSD. So they are providing this image here, the software image, and this image will be deployed on the virtual machine that we are creating. So uh, we come here, okay, and this is the Azure spot discount. So you remember I was telling about the spot instance. So they provide you the option here that it offers a new capacity, it pays you prices and it offers less price. So you can check on it and then it will ask you that eviction policy that in case Azure is asking you that uh, Azure wants the space back, that extra space that you are using for the spot instance. So how will you want the eviction policy to be? Just stop and deallocate or do you want to delete your virtual machine itself as well? And then there are some other options, capacity only. So when evicted, only the capacity, this excess capacity disappears or price and all of that. So we're just gonna stick with the original VM instance for now. As for the size, so uh, virtual machines come with different sizes. B2 MS means two virtual CPUs and eight, eight GBs of memory. And uh, we can also see that what is recommended by the image publisher. So they have given these three recommendations and you can see the price there as well. Uh, and yeah, I want to mention here that this price is not the price that is charged by the vendor, but rather the price of virtual machine itself, the servers that are used by the Microsoft. So the, the price that is being deducted here, that cost will go to Microsoft because they are using their virtual machine. So we can select any one of them, let's just select two vCPUs and eight gigabytes. And you can get more specification of this um, on, on this website, azureprice.net. So Fatma might share this in the chat. Uh, here you can see the classifications of different virtual machines, their specifications, the best price and region for it. And yeah. So if we go down here and the other thing is the account. So remember I told you that you can access and customize the virtual machine that you want. So in order to do that, you should be able to connect to that virtual machine because when I will create it, it will be on the portal, right? So how can I connect to that remote machine? It is a virtual machine, but it is present on a remote platform. So I need to connect to it. So we, what we do is we set up the authentication type to be password so that not anybody can access it. Only I who have the password can access it. And then I specify some username here. So let me specify here. I can set some password here as well. And once that's done, I have added everything, final check, and then I click on review plus create. So here they're providing that MetaBase packaged by DSD, not covered by credits. So they are not charging anything here, but the virtual machine cost that, that is there, that is charged by, by Microsoft, right? And that will be around 0 0.0832 US dollars per hour. So that is pretty less. And if you were using the spot instance, that would have been even more less. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Let's just click on create. And the deployment takes some time. So, and by deployment, it means that it takes that software image that was of MetaBase and it deploys it on our virtual machine that we have created. So it will take some time. Okay, maybe that was a good good yes. time we do have a question not super relevant to what exactly you're doing but um uh was wondering if you could talk a little bit about azure data factory do you have any experience with that uh azure data no i have uh, i haven't worked with data factory okay so if you ask that question sorry but uh maybe we can do a separate webinar on that 
Yeah, uh, there, there have been some webinars, I think, on Data Factory. Some guys have given it lately. And with, with, with single deployment, it's not just that the image gets deployed on the virtual machine. There are many different secondary resources that are created with it as well. So there's an NSG. NSG is called the Network Security Group. There's the IP. IP that is the IP for this virtual machine. There's a virtual network that is created for the resource group. Every time, whenever uh, you create a resource, uh, VM especially, a virtual net is created for that whole resource group. And from that virtual net, an IP is assigned to your uh, virtual machine. So here the deployment is completed. We can click on go to resource. And so this tells us all the information about the VM that we have created. The name is Metabase VM. Uh, and here we have operating system. So it is deployed on Ubuntu 20.04. The size here is as well. And if you go down, so the IP is here as well. So remember what they what the publisher told us that in order to access it, we need to copy our IP. And we have to add a port at the end. So the port was, I think, 3000. So we can add this here and enter it. So, okay, so Paladin is a cyber security tool. It says that your IP address does not have a proper domain, so it is blocking the access. But we know it is safe. So you can click on proceed. And here we are uh, with Metabase installed. So here, I, as of now, none of my personal CPU is being used. I did not try to install Metabase. I did not need to care about uh, what are the dependency issues about version, none of that. I just went onto the marketplace. I just click on create, added some information, and that's it. This is called single click deployments. And I have the software here now. So let's get started. English, next. Okay. Let's enter some information. Next. And here they have the option to add your data. So, uh, uh, okay, so let's see how many options they have. Okay, so they have quite a large number of versatility for database connections. Let's just stick onto the basic data. They, they provide a sample database. The connection will take some time. So I'll add my data later. And usage data preferences. Okay, so this is just for the webinar. So no need to send them information. Take me to my database. Okay, so once I'm here, this is the main web page of Metabase. They are providing some sample x rays as well, There's some glances on the data. So let's explore the data first, right? Anytime when you want to do, uh, when you want to extract some information from the data, you want to draw visualizations, draw some conclusions, you always have to analyze the data first, right? And you do not need to be an engineer or anything for that. The database is a simple collection of records and tables. So anybody can do that. Let's check the orders table here. Okay, so. Okay, so uh, here they have product ID. Okay, subtotals create it at and the quantity that quantity of the product that was sold at this particular day. So in February 11, 2019, two quantities of this product was sold, product ID. And the product ID is probably the foreign key here from the product table. So it is being used here. So, okay, so let's check what's in the visualization tab. So they are saying that you can choose a visualization from the following things. 
the scatter chart, waterfall chart, row chart, bar chart, line chart, area chart, and all of these you can use. Okay, so let's check. Okay, so what do we want to find here? We need to know that first. So I want to see that with, with different dates, what is the quantity highest I had, or, or just I just want to get the trend that on uh, from 2019 to whatever the present date, the data is here, how much quantity highest I had. So let's click on area. Let's select on X axis, create it at. On Y, let's select quantity. Okay, so we have this graph prepared here just by clicking, nothing else. And here, if I hover over it, I can also see the information about that. And I think this is the peak where the quantity of orders has touched the highest. So if I hover over here, I can see in October 22, 2018, I got the highest quantity of uh, 60 plus 60 plus orders in a single day were achieved in the month of October. Uh, October 2018. So we can grasp information like this easily, quite easily, using this tool. And uh, as I said, that it is very, it is a very easy tool, especially if you're like uh, if you're a novice, you do not know anything about uh, SQL coding or Power BI. So this is a relatively easy tool to use. So let's explore Query Builder as well, right? Let's explore that too. So there is the option of new. And in new, you have the option of SQL query as well. So if you know how to use SQL, you know how to insert commands, select commands, so you can do that as well, uh, directly from the database, or you can go to the question. So question is basically a query. Whatever, you, whatever query you create, whether you want to join some tables, anything you want to do, in metabase, it is called question. So you click on it. And okay, so again, when you want to do some querying, you need to also understand that what do you want to find? What's your end goal? So we need to figure that out first. So let's just go back to the database again and see what should be fine. So let's go to the reviews table. So here is, are the names of the reviewers. We have ratings here as well. Body has some text and then created it. We can also filter uh, however we want. So we can do that here as well. If you want to select rating equal to three, then all of them will be filtered just by three. So I want to find that what's, what's the name of the product that has all ratings of five. Like I just want to check that different people why they have rated the particular product as five and I want to get the name of the product as well. So in this table, I do not have the product title, right? I cannot see, but they have provided a foreign key to the product ID and product ID is present in the product table, which has the name of the table, right? So when we have cases like this, we use joins. Using join, we can, get, we can take the product ID from this table and the product ID from the product table we can join the board, we can join board tables, and then we can access the columns attributes of the other tables and this table as well. So let's just do that. So now we have a goal of what we want to achieve. So now we should go to the question, um, the reviews table, and what I want to find here, I want to get uh, the rating, yeah and the product ID because on product ID, a join will be created. So I will let it be here. Then there is this option of join data. And by the way, this interface is called query builder. I'm not writing any SQL queries here. Anything that happens, the SQL queries are running at the backend of this tool. So I click on join data. There's the option of picking up a table. So um, that is from the products table, product ID. So automatically it, it, uh, it told us that 
the reviews table has a product ID and the products table has a product ID and it is applying the join automatically here. And it is doing the job there. And let's just say, I want to apply the filters on rating. I want to check only those which have a rating of five. Click on add filter. And then we have the option to summarize as well, like how you want to summarize, do you want to find the count or you want to find the sum and everything. So let's just leave that for now. We can add it later on as well and click on visualize. So now we have all these different information here about created at the products, the vendor product title we have here as well. Product, okay, I think we didn't shortlisted the the product table, right? That's why it is showing price from the product table and everything. But anyways, it's it's okay. Now you can see that the filter was applied. We can see all the ratings are five. And earlier we only had the product ID table, but now I can also see the product title and also can see the category as well. So that's pretty nice, right? I, I'm now able to know that five rating is being given to a rustic paper wallet five times yeah but when you have large amounts of data the good approach is that you visualize it so that you can grasp all information quickly right so let's go to the visualization here um let's go to the bar chart here and on the x-axis let's have let's have categories that which, which category has been rated the highest which category has been rated five times five or five the most times that will so and, and you should know that how will it uh, affect the business as, aspect of it a businessman how how will it help him if he gets to know that uh, a particular category has been uh, ha, has been rated the most so what he could do is that he can provide some discounts in it so that he can boost the sales furthermore so these are some conclusions that are driven by business analysts when they do when they use these tools so on the x-axis, I need to have category. And on the y-axis, I can select rating. So I can see that Gizmo here has the highest and these other categories have less amount of rating. But if I click here, I, I do not get the proper information here, like a uh, product site is just showing a single record here. So when we have cases like this, we use the summarize filter. And I want to summarize by count on what I'm using the category, right? As the x-axis. So whenever you summarize by count, you also have to group by it as well. So I am trying to group it by category. Now, when I do this, now it is pretty clear. Gizmo has a count of 107. It means that 107 times this product has been rated five out of five. This category has been rated five out of five. So now I have some information, some business insight. Same can be drawn for the products as well. I can replace category with products and I can get the same result uh, with, uh, at, at the product level. This is at the category level. I can get at the product level as well. And now, for example, I want to save this, right? So how can I do that? There is an option of save here. I can click on save. It is saying that you are saving a question. Remember, this is a query and I was visualizing it. Let's just let it be here, the collection. Let's just keep it at our analytics. I click on save. And now they're saying that, do you want to add this to the dashboard as well? So they have an option of creating dashboards as well. I click on yes, please create a new dashboard. And our create. So here we have our dashboard, and this is the this is the query that we had, and we can expand it if you want. And there are different options of adding text as well. So you can add text here as well.
We can drag and drop here however we want. And we can add multiple uh, graphs like uh, that like however we want. It's possible. And once you do that, you also have the option to uh, share it as well. So you can also specify emails to the people and you can send them as well. But for that, I think you need to set up the emailing system uh, who you want to send. You can connect to Slack as well. So if you're uh, if, if you're working in a company and some your boss has told you to that this is the data, do this, and then email me the reports. So you come on this tool, draw the visualizations, prepare the dashboard, and email him. That's it. You do not you didn't even use any coding. <laughs> like it, it is just basic basic drag and drop and Click and done. That's it. And that's pretty much it from Metabase. So I think it's it, it's uh, I chose this tool because uh, it is quite easy and it does not require any coding here as well. There can be different tools as well. Uh, maybe we have some time. Nathan, do we have some time? Can we explore another one? Uh, yeah, we've got about fifteen minutes. If you want to explore something okay. else. Okay. Okay. So let's quickly. Explore another tool. Let's explore Zeppelin. If, if you guys have used Jupyter Notebook, Zeppelin is like that, but it provides uh, a lot a lot more flexibility in terms of interpreters. Like you can use Spark, Scala, and different interpreters there. In Jupyter Notebook, I think you can, you are restricted with Python only, but with Zeppelin, you can explore different. Uh, so let's go there. And yeah, another thing. The good approach is that once you're done with your work, I've completed it. Okay. Now you have to click on the stop to stop the virtual machine because if you do not, the, remember the cost is still going on. So you have to click on stop. And once you do that, it will take some time stopping virtual machine and it will get stopped. Okay. So, so while we, while we take some time to let it stop, uh, we do have a couple of questions. So what about okay, saving sure. the state of running a VM? Saving the state? Uh, can, you, uh, elaborate, yeah. can you elaborate the question a bit? Harry, can you elaborate on your question for me? Um, you can just leave a, you should be able to comment on it. Um, uh, but separate question, uh, can you create your own virtual machine configs like an AMI on AWS. Okay, uh, I do not know much about AWS, but on Azure, you can do that. You can create a virtual machine. You can connect to that virtual machine using SSH and you can install anything you want in it. So you can alter the configurations inside the virtual machine. You can have a virtual machine for Ubuntu. You can have a virtual machine for Windows. Yeah, so you can alter the configuration inside it. That's why it is called the infrastructure as a service. Mm -hmm. And and Harry's um, uh, given us more of an example for the um, saving the state of a running VM. It would be saving state like an AWS snapshot. Okay. Does that make any sense? <laughs> um, no. no? Uh, okay. okay. Uh, yeah, th there is one option uh, where, where you can save the uh, uh, if, I want to say like save the state. It's like, uh, for example, you have installed, uh, like for example, I, I created a virtual machine and I installed uh, Jupyter Lab in it. Okay, now I want to create an image of it. So there is an option of capture. You can see on the screen, there's an option of capture here. So what it does is that it takes a snapshot of the VM with all the current things in it. Okay, so when I create, you can see the option right, create an image. So when I create this image, a gallery will be created with a VM of, uh, what is the VM that we're using? We're using Ubuntu. And I installed Jupyter Lab in it. So now if I create the image, the virtual machine will not only have Metabase in it, but also if I install Jupyter Lab in it, it will have both of these things. So if you mean by this thing, so yeah, in Azure, this you have the option to take a snapshot, an image will be created, and then you can publish that image on the marketplace as well. So you can you have all the options to customize anything you want at any given point. 
And let's go to the marketplace again. I'm directly going to the one that is packaged by DSD because they are free. So that will be quick. So Zeppelin usually uses uh, a higher amount of memory because it has a greater number of interpreters. You can see that they have provided a whole lot of interpreters here. And they open at 8080. Now I want to install another, I want to deploy another one so I can select the same uh, that I had. The same resource group and I name it as okay to all you have the screen. So remember when I select, uh, I had SSH selected by default. So it said that you need to create a private key. So I can quickly set it to some other password that I have. I mean, when you, you all can ask questions if you want. Oh, we're deployed. Okay. Oh, it's in process. I was going to say, Saad, if this is going to take a little while, I can introduce next week's webinar while we wait, and then um, we can come back okay, to sure. it. Uh, okay. uh, uh, actually, Harry has asked. Uh, yeah, Harry, you're right, actually. Uh, yeah, you're right. But uh, do people use still Julia? I don't think many people still opt for that. Mostly people uh, opt for Python and R. But yeah, with Zeppelin, you have interpreters. Interpreters and languages are about different things, by the way. Is my screen share? It is, yes. So with Zeppelin, when you come onto the port 8080 after specifying your IP, just like before, you can come onto this page and there you have already some tutorials of Flink, of Python, R, Spark. You can create notebooks and you can specify different interpreters here as well. But there's a catch in, in Zeppelin. Uh, given that it is not limited to, uh, to a specific number of interpreters, sometimes you need to specify some paths as well. So that, that, that is where the configuration thing comes in. They are providing you the software, but you also have to set some, uh, some information in it, right? So usually, usually some tools uh, have the option to specify paths and directories directly from the UI. Zeppelin has the option to specify directly from the UI, but some tools require you to connect to your virtual machine as well. So you have to do that through SSH and you specify the name. Remember what the name I said? And then you have to specify the IP as well. Then you can connect to your virtual machine. So uh, I just wanted to give this information. Uh, it is a good tool, I believe. But with Zeppelin, you need to specify a higher amount of memory. The smaller amount won't work much. So they are so they are saying that you need to have some prerequisites here. Pip install Jupyter, pip install. So you can also install whatever you want here as well. It's not that it is limited to what it is. You can also install more Python libraries and everything else. 
so they already have point laws installed in it and if you run it you can see the different uh, counts and everything based on the data and on the visualization they have matplotlib installed by default as well so that's nice pandas is there too seaborn is there as well usually uh, usually it is advised not to do that you have to give the the room for the users to install these libraries because once the more you install the more it gets heavier and the more then you have to scale up your virtual machine so that's why but they have uh, given the users with all of these libraries pre uh, installed by default so that's a good thing as well plot nine and bouquet is actually in my opinion bouquet is one of the best uh, interactive visualization and when it comes to coding and you're coding then bouquet provides the best interactivity you have options to drag pan and everything here so yeah just wanted to give the brief information about zeppelin similarly there are tons of tools out there in the marketplace you can install them on your virtual machine you if you just want to have a basic virtual machine you can do that as well you can directly go to the marketplace and select a, a, a basic virtual machine as well you can install and instantiate a windows virtual machine as well with virtual machine of windows you need to have an rdp file for an rd you need to have an rd and you have to connect to that rdp file and once you do that you get inside that virtual machine so your windows your laptop will only be uh, focused into that and if you want to come out of it then mostly you have to uh, like quit or uh, yeah there, there isn't much help when it comes to virtual machines of windows but with these virtual machines of ubuntu uh, you can easily uh, connect it disconnect it you can uh, do all your work here and there so uh yeah that's pretty much from the Azure marketplace and working with virtual machines. If you All have right. any questions, please drop them. All right. Thanks, Saad. Let's give it a minute to see if anybody's typing out some questions. And then um, if not, we can we can just uh, jump off. And Harry was saying, you know, Julia doesn't have a ton of users right now. R, R is very popular for people with statistics. Yeah, but that's generally right. they they use our studio, which is also what I always hear. So. Yeah, yeah, our studio is a pretty nice tool, and even in our studio, they provide you the opportunity to write code in Python. So yeah, it is all interlinked. In Jupyter, you can use R, and our studio, you can use Python as well. All right, so I'm not seeing any questions coming in, so I think we can end here. So thank you so much, Saad, for being here today. I uh, really appreciate having you and thank you everyone for joining, whether you're on uh, one of our live streams or in Zoom with us. I uh, really appreciate you coming in, asking questions, taking some time out of your day to spend it with us. Uh, don't